Welcome, who joined us. My name's Orton Rosner. Remember me, I'm the president of the club. And uh, welcome aboard, everybody. I think uh, this is our new greeting, our new handshake, since we have to maintain our social distancing. So instead of handshaking, bump, elbow bumping, um, we can do this when we meet each other. <laughs> Introductions. Remember, these are the members of the club. They are active people. The club is still active. Just because we don't have on-site general meetings doesn't mean that the club has stopped. Board of Directors, we have been meeting, uh, talking about uh, the future and if we should open or not and when we are expected to open, um, making decisions about the Zoom meetings. Um, Greco, Claude has been uh, maintaining Greco, even though it's not open, he's been maintaining it. Nothing's going on on outreach. David Hatch has been doing uh, some property management for us. Of course, uh, Marty, our website and newsletter editor, uh, every month, he's uh, putting that together for us. Uh, Wayne is also our observing coordinator, too. So if you like astronomy challenges, go on our website and look up the observing program. Wayne does that. And then currently, Rob Baldwin is our AL rep. It's in transition right now to... Um, to uh, our secretary, Brooks Schofield. So here's your club. Remember, we're still working. It's still a viable and operating club. <clears throat> Let's get on the current business. Uh, remember, all EVAC personal contact events remained canceled. That's star parties, outreach events, our library meetings. All of those personal contact events, every one of them have been canceled and are still on hold. When are we going to open back up? We don't know yet, uh, especially now since there's a spike in the virus and we, um, there's more unknowns than there are knowns right now. We still remain closed. And that doesn't mean you can't go out in your backyard or go other places and observe, by all means, taking precautions. But anything officially evac, where persons get together, has been postponed. None of that is going on as of yet. When it does, then we will be uh, updating everyone on our website. Just go into our website, and on the top of the very first page, gives us the news and the current situation of the club. And that goes for Greco too. Greco uh, Observatory still remains closed. Uh, don't know when it's gonna open, but we still have to study the situation, keep on top of it, and make sure when it's safely uh, ready to do so and we have precautions in place, then we will let, let everyone know. A member presentations. We are back doing general meetings. They're just online now instead of in person. So if you're interested, then uh, let me know. And you can just send me a little blurb on our website uh, at the bottom of the first page. There's contact the president, and that's an email directly to me. And let me know that you're interested in doing one of these member presentations. And then I can um, schedule for it and chat a little bit about when's the best time to get it scheduled on in. Um, the Grand Canyon Star Party, you know, this week it's been going on all week and although attendance is quite low, they are doing a lot of online stuff. Now it ends tomorrow evening. So um, if you want to is look at the Facebook, uh, our EVAC Facebook page, there's a link in there. And you can go ahead and, and join in on some online stuff there. But Grand Canyon Star Party ends tomorrow. Uh, while you're in the website, check out what's going on with other clubs and other organizations in the state. The observatories, uh, Lowell, 
Kit Peak are all listed on our website. Click on them and you'll find out what other clubs are doing. They are doing online stuff and online presentations also. For instance, the Phoenix Astronomical Society, uh, they have one coming up on July 9th. They changed their date. It was yesterday, but they changed it to July 9th. So things like that you might want to also get in on. <clears throat> So I'd like to right now is jump in on our member presentation. So Wayne Thomas will give our member presentation this time. Wayne, it's all yours. Thank you, Gordon. Let's see if I can get this uh, uh, going can stop, here. Can you stop sharing, Gordon? Yes. Okay. Looking good, Wayne. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I wish I could see you in person. Uh, it's kind of a, a bummer not to be able to socialize a bit, but we're all in it together. And at least I have this opportunity to wish you all well and, and safe, um, safe travels, whatever. So tonight I want to uh, talk to you about what I do for asteroid occultations. Um, as many of you know, it's my thing. I, that's what I do. So first up, let's take a look at uh, an asteroid occultation uh, that was back on May 10th. Well, let, let's back up a little bit. First of all, what is an asteroid occultation? It's not all that different from a solar eclipse where the moon gets in front of our, our star, the sun. However, there are some significant differences. Uh, the asteroids are in an orbit between typically between Mars and Jupiter, and they're a lot smaller than our moon, uh, most of them. And the stars aren't light minutes from us. They're like tens or hundreds or thousands of light years distance. So by the time the light gets to the Earth, uh, it's basically a, a point source that we're looking at. So here's a, an event that occurred in May, on May 10th. Uh, this was the asteroid 363 Padua, which came in front of a 6.6 .6 magnitude star. Uh, the predicted time uh, was at universal 05-16-20 uh, or 21. So if you kind of look to see that time, uh, 1620, you'll see this really bright star go away. I typically take about a, a 60 second uh, duration exposure to make sure I catch everything. You might notice that I don't have things focused very well. Uh, this was intentional. I didn't want to oversaturate the pixels of the really bright star. Whoops, where to go? And now it's back. So how did I choose this event? Or first of all, what what is the point of doing asteroid occultations? Well, first of all, the models that we have of the orbits are not all that accurate, although they're pretty good. So if we can uh, locate the asteroid in relation to the distant stars at a point in time, we can use that to improve our model. Sometimes we can discover double stars. We notice that by a double dip in the brightness uh, of the star when the asteroid goes in front of it. Uh, or we can discover or verify that some of the asteroids have satellites, or maybe it's a double asteroid. And finally, uh, with the, uh, using these um, occultations, we can validate shape models. So here's my track record for so far for 2020. I have planned to do 66 occultations. I've had positives on 18 of them negatives on 15 of them, and 26 of them I didn't really uh, observe, either because of the clouds or I slept in. So here's the drill. First, I review the predictions. Uh, the, one of the more important ones is where is it in the sky? If it's too low, I don't want to do it. Another one is the probability. I typically don't do them if they're less than 10% or so. Uh, and also, where 
where's the shadow predicted to be? Uh, if I'm within the shadow, then that's, that's the one that I really want to observe. Second, uh, I observe it. I verify that I'm in the right star field. I make my recording. Following that, I reduce my data. I measure the brightness of the star uh, before, during, and after the occultation, and then I analyze it. And finally, I submit my report to the International Occultation Timing Association. I do that, uh, and hopefully there are other people as well that gives us uh, lots of information. So for Padua, this was a 6.6 .6 magnitude star that was going to drop about eight magnitudes when a 14.7 magnitude asteroid went in front of it. It was altitude 27 degrees uh, to the west, and the maximum duration was decent at 3.3 seconds. And from my location in Tempe, the probability was like nine out of 10, which is really good. Here's the ground track. Uh, it was supposed to go over both Phoenix and Tucson, and I'm located uh, about there near Mesa, between Mesa and Phoenix in Tempe. I printed out a star chart, which is provided by uh, IOTA. And my, my camera doesn't take all 30 arc minutes that are shown here. Maybe it only takes up halfway and down halfway and maybe halfway to the left and halfway to the right. So then I compare that star chart to my field of view when I get on the star. My equipment consists of an 11 inch SCT on a CGEM mount, uh, has a, uh, a run cam uh, night uh, astro video camera on the back, which has a, a very low uh, defect rate. So it's an excellent camera for what, what I do. The feed from that camera uh, goes into the uh, video time inserter, which puts a timestamp on every frame of the video recording. Then the output from that goes into my um, uh, a star tech star tech uh, A to D converter, uh, which is shown on the right just before it goes to my laptop computer. I set up earlier this week for another occultation, and I took a picture of the laptop showing the time remaining until the recording was to start. It shows two hours, 40 minutes, 42 seconds uh, until start of recording. Here's uh, the program I use, uh, the light measurement tool uh, for uh, occultations. I put a, an aperture around the star, and then I have wings on either side to measure the background uh, illumination. The aperture is supposed to measure the star uh, brightness. Uh, I record that, and then I feed that into a program, uh, uh, Pyote, which then produces a profile of the intensity. Uh, the blue dots uh, represent each frame of the video, and then when the asteroid went in front of the uh, star, you notice that it drops way down, and then as soon as it passes by, it goes back up. The uh, red lines indicate that I have problems with my timestamps. Uh, when the Pyote program cannot read the timestamp on the video frames, it tells me about it with these vertical red lines. I think I have a solution to that now, but we'll have to uh, wait and make sure that that's verified. So the results for this particular event were fantastic. It tells me when the uh, star went away, when it reappeared with uh, two sigma probabilities in the millisecond range, 2.8 milliseconds for each. And then the duration was measured to be 3.2 seconds uh, with uh, two sigma uncertainty of uh, about four milliseconds. The mag drop is less than predicted. It was predicted to be eight. Uh, I got 4.9 in my data. That might be, that was a notice that there's an occultation coming tonight in four hours. Uh, this might be due to saturation of the pixels. That might have caused it to reduce the, uh, the magnitude drop that's measured. Uh, the signal to noise ratio is one of the best I've seen. Uh, 20 is fantastic. 
then when I put my, uh, when uh, IOTA puts my results together with everyone else, they can draw a best fit ellipse to represent where the asteroid was at when it uh, passed by. You'll notice that there's some dots that go across uh, representing one of the tracks. Uh, this is the center line of the predicted path. And then the center of the best fit ellipse, you'll notice is somewhat offset from that. So this is a, a measurement to improve uh, the prediction of, of where the asteroid will be in the future. Now, not all events are like this. For example, on June 4th, the asteroid 185 Unike was predicted to occult a really faint star. Uh, I believe it was like 13.6 uh, magnitude, and the magnitude drop was going to be only 0.2 magnitudes. But I gave it a try anyway, and the results uh, came out okay. The green dots represent a comparison star uh, used for reference to make sure nothing weird's going on, and the blue dots represented the uh, star that was occulted. You notice that the intensity of the star before the occultation was about 500, maybe a little bit more. And then during the occultation, Peyote determined that it was maybe 450, 460 or something. So it's not very much of a drop. Uh, so I, I'm really impressed that the software can uh, pull this out. So for results, uh, it gives the disappearance, the reappearance time, but the two sigma uncertainty is like 1.6 seconds, not milliseconds. And the duration of 23.5 seconds has a two sigma uncertainty of 2.3 seconds. The nominal mag drop is 0.11, which is quite a bit less than the predicted two. A signal to noise ratio is not even 0.5. If we put all the results together of everyone who observed it, the uh, best fit ellipse uh, you'll see is uh, rather strange. Not all the observations are on the, the ellipse. But the prediction represented by these dots is not too far off from where the asteroid was. I think my observation is the blue line here, and you'll see that my error bars are quite large compared to some of the other measurements. Um, let's see, I, I know that uh, uh, David and Joan Dunham are, are viewing this, uh, but I don't see them as, as one of the viewers of this particular event. So what would it take to, to do this? If you really want to jump in and do this, I would recommend that you acquire the complete kit uh, for a little bit over 500 bucks. You get a Runcam Night Eagle 2 Pro Astro camera, the IOTA video time inserter, and the StarTech uh, analog to digital converter. Plus, you need batteries and telescope and laptop computer and a few other things. So with that, here are some references. Uh, the first three, uh, occultations.org, observing our IOTA uh, website. It has recommended equipment, occultation predictions, and software. The software is free. So uh, other than the hardware, uh, you can get into this uh, rather relatively inexpensively. Um, the last reference here, I uh, publish a, an extraction of a cult watcher, which is the online tool that I use to determine what the predictions are. And uh, David Dunham puts that on the, uh, the website. I think it's the Harvard uh, University Applied Physics Lab website for me. So this, this has the uh, predictions for Arizona for June, for July, and, and I'll have August out there uh, towards the end of this month or first of next month. Uh, with that, um, I guess... Uh, we're open for questions if we have time. So, so Wayne, you have um, two, two questions. One of them is, how is your time standardized? 
I guess the main okay. part, how does this time stamp it? Okay, the, uh, the time stamp uh, keys off of uh, the um, GPS satellites. So the uh, IOTA uh, video time inserter has a, a GPS receiver in it, and it does all the calculations to make sure that the timestamps that it's putting on the video uh, are accurate uh, with the GPS time. And it, it uses the location data as well as the signals coming in from, I think, as many as nine satellites. Okay. And let's see, there's one other question. Are you able to view the more dramatic magnitude drop occultations with only a regular camera? Uh, there are other techniques besides video cameras. Uh, one of them is a technique of using uh, uh, a, 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 what do they call it? A, a handheld um, a camera that you would use to shoot uh, scenic shots or night shots and just put it on a tripod, a very rigid tripod, and, and let the star uh, scan across the, the field of view. And then if you have a way to um, know what the time is at specific points in that drift, uh, you can then reduce that, that data and, and do timings with that. I'm, I've never done it, so I'm not a, an expert on it, but I, I know other people have done it that way. So Wayne, it appears that someone with a telescope and a DSLR attached can actually see the occultation and photograph it, right? That they can. Uh, the, the one limitation is uh, the combined magnitude of the star and the asteroid has to be bright enough that it will register on the DSLR. Any other questions? I think that is it. Now, should I hit stop share? Uh, yes, yeah, stop, stop sharing would be good. Okay, and then I probably want to mute. Okay, and then I'll, I'll introduce our, our speaker. <clears throat> um, Dr. Patrick Young is a theoretical astrophysicist and astrobiologist and is an associate professor at ASU's School of Earth and Space Exploration. He's interested in the lives and deaths of stars and their effects on their environments from synthesis of the chemical elements to planetary habitability. His current research touches on several areas. And he's currently a science lead on the NASA Nexus project for exoplanet system sciences um, called Exoplanetary Ecosystems, headquartered at ASU. And since August of 2017, he has been Associate Director for Community Outreach. So extra welcome uh, to Patrick um, and, and Cece here. With further ado, I'll turn it over to um, Dr. Young. Thank you very much, Tom. And thank you all very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. I was very sad to miss you in person earlier this spring. But now that we're together on Zoom, you know exactly what it is like to be a professional astronomer these days. So I have a couple of different interests in astrophysics that sort of meet in the middle. And today I'm going to talk about the one that I've been doing pretty much since I started out here. And that's looking at the evolution and deaths of stars, and in particular, supernovae. So I want to tell you a little story today. And that story is going to involve some time travel because there's nothing physicists love to talk about more than time travel. And we'll head back to 2.6 million years ago. About 50 light years away from Earth, a massive star ended its life. And dust formed in the rapidly expanding debris from that event. 
And millions of years later, on Earth, at the bottom of the sea floor, we find nodules of manganese-rich minerals with radioactive iron in them. Now this iron, an isotope called iron-60, has a pretty short half-life. So it's roughly three million years. And if this was present when the Earth formed, we would not find any of this radioactive iron. It had to be delivered to us sometime during the intervening billions of years since the Earth formed. And actually, most likely, very recently, since it's there in detectable quantities. Just a year ago, a neutron star was identified that is possibly associated with the event that produced this radioactive iron and sent it to Earth. Fast forward a little bit to the year 185, and Chinese astronomers see a new star in the night sky, a very bright star that then fades from sight over eight months. And 18 centuries later, astronomers catalog some cosmic wreckage in the same spot. A little bit further ahead, 1054, and on July 4th, astronomers around the world, China, Japan, the Middle East, and even in Chaco Canyon in northern New Mexico, record a bright new star. And this star is visible in daylight for three weeks and at night for a couple of years. And in 1758, Charles Messier found the very first of his objects that are not the comets he was looking for at this spot in the sky. And finally, in 1987, on February 24th, an astronomer in New Zealand noticed another one of these guest stars. And if you take a look at the images here, the image on the right has an arrow pointing to a star called Sandalea minus 62202, which is at the same point in the sky as this new object. And once this new object faded, it was no longer there. This is the closest one of these events to happen to us since 1680. So the first one in the era of modern astronomy. And we have observations of its evolution over the last 30 years in wavelengths all the way from the longest radio waves up to gamma rays. We even have measured neutrinos from this event. Neutrinos are these tiny little subatomic particles that do not like to interact with matter, but they turn out to be very important in this kind of situation. You've just had about 100 billion of them streak through you in the course of this sentence. So the fact that we were able to detect these from this event 150,000 light years away tells you that it was a pretty big deal. It's also the first one of these events to happen in the era of modern computer simulations. So this is actually a simulation done at the time by my grad school advisor, Dave Arnett. And all of these objects are supernovae. The ones we're going to be talking about today in particular are the deaths of massive stars, more than about eight times the mass of our sun. And I'll set you up with a little bit of scale here. So 100 watt light bulb as our starting point. Skip up to another familiar thing in kind of an unfamiliar setting, the sun puts out about 400 trillion trillion watts. So four with 26 zeros after it. If we look at a galaxy not too dissimilar to ours, so M51 here, it has about 100 billion solar luminosities coming out, 10 to the 37 watts. 
when a supernova goes off, that's the light of another 100 billion suns, more or less, coming from one tiny spot in the galaxy. So besides just being impressive, these have a very fundamental importance to how we got here to be impressed by them, among other things. So let's jump back again, this time almost 14 billion years to three minutes after the Big Bang. And in the beginning, there was not much when you think about it in terms of the periodic table and the chemical elements. Three minutes after the Big Bang, 76% by mass of the normal material in the universe was made up of hydrogen. 24% helium, one part in a billion, the next three elements, and then everything heavier than boron was present at one part in a trillion. If we fast forward a little bit to the formation of the sun, things look pretty similar. Hydrogen and helium have changed a little bit, and we have 1.5% other things, most common being oxygen, carbon, silicon, nitrogen, magnesium, iron, familiar things. And 1.5% doesn't really seem like a lot, but it's an increase of a factor of 10 billion from our starting point which is awfully convenient for us because it fills out the rest of this periodic table. And just to get some basic terms out there that we might bounce around between later on, every element is defined by what its nucleus looks like. And that's made up of positively charged protons and electrically neutral neutrons with a cloud of electrons around them. Elements are defined by the number of protons, and each element can have multiple isotopes with different numbers of neutrons. And these elements can have stable isotopes and radioactively unstable ones that might decay in fractions of a second or billions of years, depending on the nuclear structure. So in order to get this periodic table that we see today, we need to go from that one part in a billion to that 1.5% to get our naturally occurring elements and all of the isotopes that we've been able to measure in colliders and nuclear physics experiments. Because if we do not have this huge increase in the abundance of all of these other elements, we don't get things like the elements that make life possible. The elements that you build rocks and planets out of. The elements that make technological civilization possible. And the shiny elements that make technological civilization kind of obnoxious to actually function in. So how do we get from hydrogen, which won't even do this without some oxygen around, to rocks and stuff? Well, the answer, as I'm sure most of you are thoroughly familiar with, is through stars. And to understand why this happens, we have to ask what seems like a very basic question. And that's why do stars shine? So stars are big, tens of thousands to tens of millions of times the mass of Earth. You ever have a hard time getting out of bed in the morning? Imagine how gravity feels to a star. That gravity is going to compress the star, compressing the gas and plasma that make it up and heating that gas. The pressure of it causes the gas to expand. And that balance between pressure and gravity is called hydrostatic equilibrium. Now this works out because when you compress gas and heat it up, 
that hotter gas has a higher pressure. Hot gas does one other thing. It glows. So that star is dumping energy out into the universe, which means it's cooling off the interior of the star and removing pressure support, unless you have a way of replacing that energy. So next question is, where do we get that energy from? If we look at meteorites, we know that the oldest solid material in the solar system is 4.5679 billion years old, plus or minus about 200,000. This is a measurement that came out of the Center for Meteorite Studies at Arizona State University. And I just love quoting it because I love the idea that you can know a number this big to that kind of precision. So we know the formation of the earliest bits of solid stuff in the solar system to about the lifespan of our own species. And this really big number tells us that chemical burning cannot power a star. If you had a pile of coal with the mass of the sun, you could get about 15,000 years out of it. Coal is just not viable as an energy source, no matter how hard the coal industry tries to support itself. Gravitation, gravitational contraction does much better. If you just heated up the sun with the energy of the material falling in as it contracted, you would get about 10 million years of the sun at its current brightness. But after the 19th century, it became clear that that was not going to work because Marie Curie came along and discovered the phenomenon of radioactive decay, which allowed us to measure the ages of rocks on Earth. And we find that the Earth is much older than 10 million years. For a moment, it seemed like there was hope in radioactive decay. But no, Earth's about 5 billion years old, but nuclear fission only gets you a billion years of energy. And we can tell pretty easily that the sun is not made out of entirely uranium, so we wouldn't even get that 1 billion years. The final answer, of course, is nuclear fusion. So hydrogen is the most common stuff out there. It's also the easiest abundant element to fuse. By easy, we mean you have to get up to millions of degrees Kelvin under moderately high pressures. But, you know, as these things go, it's easy. And what you do as the first step in this process is you take four hydrogen nuclei and turn them into one nucleus of helium. And it turns out that that helium is 0.7% less massive than the hydrogen. And that mass defect comes out as energy through everyone's favorite equation, E equals mc squared. So in basically one line, we can get a pretty decent estimate of the sun's main lifetime. We need one other fact. The sun can use about 10% of its hydrogen during the main phase of its life. So we multiply 0.7% by one-tenth of the mass of the sun times the speed of light squared. That gives us the energy we have available. And if we divide it by the rate at which the sun is losing energy, we find out that the prediction for its lifetime is about 10 billion years, which is remarkably close to what I get when I run my sophisticated stellar evolution code. Now, the more massive your star is, the brighter it is because it has to be hotter to support itself against its own gravity. And these can be millions of times brighter than the sun, so they use their fuel much faster. And those lives can be as short as three million years. And when those stars run out of fuel, 
gravity at least temporarily wins, compresses the star, and heats it up. Now eventually, it heats up enough that new things can fuse in the core. It's harder to get helium nuclei to stick together because you have two positive charges in each one to stick together. But get things hot enough, they move fast enough to do it. And each stage gets shorter and shorter. So we're really getting into the story of nucleosynthesis now. Hydrogen turns into helium. That's what the sun is doing. In fact, that's what 90% of the stars in the sky are doing because that's what takes 90% of their lifetime. Once you run out of helium, you can start to make carbon and oxygen. Aldebaran and Taurus that we see here is a red giant star that's doing this. When you run out of helium, the next thing you would do is fuse carbon. It makes neon, little magnesium, and sodium. But a star like the sun is not going to be able to do that. Turns out you have to be about eight times the mass of the sun in order to ever get hot enough to start burning carbon. Betelgeuse is one of the stars that's going to do this. Theoretically, it could already be doing this, but that stage of its life is so much shorter than the helium burning phase that the odds are against it. Still though, I lie outside at night and say, go, 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 when I look up at Orion. And when you get your star to this point, it's huge. Uh, you can actually take a direct image of the disk of the star. However, being huge also means that it takes a long time for that object the size of Jupiter's orbit to respond to changes that are happening in the interior. So when you are doing things like turning oxygen into silicon and sulfur, along with some other things like aluminum and phosphorus, the changes happening in the interior are moving so fast that you never see their effects on the surface. So you have to do simulations. What we're seeing here is three layers where silicon is burning down towards the center, and then where oxygen is burning at the base of that darkest strip, and then an area where that heat from that burning is driving convection or mixing in the interior of the star. So carbon burning may last a thousand years, oxygen burning may last six months, silicon burning where you're making things like calcium, titanium, potassium, and iron will last about a day and a half. In that day and a half, you turn one and a half times the mass of the sun from silicon to iron peak materials, at which point you've encountered a problem. Because iron, specifically iron 56, is the most stable nucleus on the periodic table. To stick anything to it, you need to add energy. To break it apart, you need to add energy. So you're not getting any more energy to keep that pressure support up in the star. And there are a lot of things removing energy very quickly. So gravity finally wins its long battle and you get an inside out collapse. So kind of like poor Wiley e. Coyote's feet start falling before his head realizes what's happening. The very central part of the star is going to start collapsing and that information is gonna travel out at the speed of sound in the star. So what we're going to look at here is one of our simulations. And we're just looking at the inner 400 kilometers of one of these massive stars that's just starting to collapse. And before I start the simulation running, I'll give you a little bit of a preview. You're going to see material falling in and coalescing into a little ball in the center. That's going to be something a few tens of kilometers across with the density of an atomic nucleus. 
made up almost entirely of neutrons, and this is our proto-neutron star. Because that's about the densest stuff you can get in the universe without making a black hole, it's basically a solid object in the bottom. So stuff that continues to fall down is going to bounce off of it and send a shock wave out through the star. But that shock wave is going to run into material that's still falling down and it's going to get stuck. So here you see material falling in, that shock stops, and now that shock restarts. And the reason that you rescue the supernova from itself is convection. So these little filamentary things that you can see moving inwards and outwards are convection currents. Because as you form that proto-neutron star, you are making a bunch of those neutrinos that we talked about earlier. And they don't like to interact with matter, but when you are stuffing 10 billion grams of material into every cubic centimeter, even some neutrinos get stuck. About 1% of those neutrinos go into reheating the material right down here by this neutron star. The gas moves out through convection and reheats the shock, and that shock starts to move out through the star. In this simulation, we're going to be zooming out a couple of times. Right now, we're actually inside the star. And as that shock moves out and it encounters different layers in the star, it stops being a nice sphere. It develops all of these different structures from various instabilities and other processes that are going on in the explosion. And this is something that my group is particularly interested in. We want to see how these structures that form in the explosion persist for hundreds of years and deliver stuff into the interstellar gas. So you can get all sorts of different asymmetric shapes for a supernova explosion by using uh, in one of these simulations. And we see lots of different asymmetries in observed supernovae as well. So you can get these small structures like we saw in the movie. You can get big bipolar things that are structures kind of on the same size scale as the entire supernova explosion. And everything in between. And these structures reflect the part of the star that they came from. So here we've got a slice through a simulation where you're looking at the abundance of several different elements and radioactive isotopes. So if you look at the top left, a lot of the material in this ring is bright, which means it's very rich in oxygen. But silicon is in different places, as is iron, uh, titanium-44, and nickel-56, which will become very important to our story in a little bit. And what this means is that different clumps of material from the supernova carry different compositions out into the interstellar gas. So, I've concentrated on showing you simulations so far. Why should you believe those simulations? Well, we can do some observational validation of our calculations. Simplest thing we can do is just compare the structure. So here I have imposed one of those movies of the density structure of a supernova as it evolves on an object called G292, which is the remnant of a massive star supernova. And we actually get a good qualitative match to the kinds of structures you see. But far more interesting is to actually compare the individual elements, because that tells you about the history of the explosion in a lot of detail. This right here is 
the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant. So this is a star that was observed to explode in 1680, and it is my favorite object in the universe. This is a picture with X-ray, optical, and infrared information in it. And it also shows you some important things about where different elements are distributed. This yellow material here is oxygen rich. The green is rich in iron. The blue is rich in silicon. And we have maps of this remnant in about 12 different elements and isotopes that we can compare our simulations to. And the exciting thing that we just got published is actually looking at those two isotopes I showed you a couple of slides ago, titanium 44 and nickel 56. So the new star telescope in 2017 took images of Cassiopeia A in the gamma ray. This was awesome because it's the first imaging gamma ray telescope. Normal mirrors, gamma rays like to just pass right through rather than helpfully bouncing and focusing onto a detector. So it was only very recently that we were able to get images in those very energetic photons. And what we find in Cassiopeia A is these balls with the crosses for error bars on them are locations where titanium-44 is found in the remnant. The little blue globes are the location of iron from X-ray observations. And the reason we like these two isotopes is they tell us a tremendous amount about the conditions in the very center of the star in the first few seconds after the explosion, when the temperatures and conditions are at their most extreme. And what we find out when we actually do the numbers on these is that you have, first of all, very clumpy distributions. It's highly asymmetric. And also that you have two kinds of material. One has a really low ratio of iron to titanium 44, about 500 or so. The other material has a ratio of thousands of atoms of iron to every atom of titanium-44. No one's been able to reproduce this strongly bimodal distribution, but we did a 3D simulation of a cassay like explosion, and it contained some of that convective circulation that we saw. And what we're looking at here is density in the gold colors and the iron to titanium ratio in the blue colors. And we find this clumpy distribution of a few blobs with those same ratios of iron to titanium 44 falling naturally out of the simulation. So that was a really exciting result for us. And now I want to jump back into our story. We know how the elements are produced and we know what happens to them in the explosion. What does that have to do with the shape of the rest of the universe? So I'm gonna go back to the beginning of our solar system 4.6 billion years ago. In a giant molecular cloud, probably rather like Orion, with massive young stars in it, our solar system started to form. Now, one of those massive young stars went through its life, since it only lives 10 million years or so, it exploded as a supernova before our solar system was finished forming. And it turned out to have a profound impact on what it looks like today. One of the reasons for that is something called short-lived radionuclides. So these are 
radioactive elements that have very short half-lives on order of a million years. So normal aluminum is a happy, helpful element. It's all over the place. We love it. But it has one less neutron though, it's highly radioactive. It has a half-life of about 700,000 years. And if we look at meteorites, we actually find the decay products of aluminum-26. In these little white blobs that are in some meteorites called calcium aluminum rich inclusions. These minerals form at very high temperatures, so they are the earliest material that condensed out of the solar nebula. And since aluminum-26 does not last long, it has to have been produced and entered the solar system while it was forming. Too early, it all would have decayed away before we got any meteorites. Too late, and it wouldn't have been incorporated into the building blocks of these solid bodies. There are a few ways to make aluminum-26. Turns out the best ways to make it and get it into forming solar systems are supernovae. So this is a slice through a simulation of an explosion. And here the colors tell you where aluminum-26 is. And it turns out to be very abundant in these little clumps that are flying out of the explosion. And having a little clump like that that's pretty high in aluminum-26 means you can get the material into the solar system without throwing the abundances of all the other isotopes that we see completely out of whack. So let's follow our supernova a little bit further. Now we're looking at just one octant of the simulation. Supernova happened down in this corner and we've color coded it so that the supernova material is in these light blue colors. And you can see those bullets moving out into this dark blue, which is a molecular cloud that's surrounding that supernova. And the scale of this simulation is about, a, sorry, about a parsec across. Um, so when you get to the end, you see that these bullets of material have actually gotten a couple light years out from the supernova and still retain their structure so they can penetrate into little clouds that are forming into protostars and protoplanetary disks. So that protoplanetary disk that has just gotten a bunch of aluminum-26 is forming solid bodies. When you put together a planetesimal from little bits, every time you slam a new piece of material into it, the kinetic energy of that little rock gets turned into heat. If you have a large enough body, it heats up enough to melt and metals fall to the center, so you get a metallic core and rocky mantle and crust like Earth. But you have to be a certain size in order for that to work out. If we look at our own solar system, there are objects that clearly had metallic cores, which are much too small for this to have happened. So the asteroid 16 Psyche uh, which Lindy Elkins Tanton from CC is the PI on a mission to explore in 2026, is the core of one of these little bodies. So that aluminum 26 that came in from the supernova is the extra heat source that turned all of these little asteroid sized planetesimals into differentiated objects with cores, mantles, and crusts. Okay, that's a fairly esoteric example with a species of radioactive isotope that's very low in abundance and very short-lived. So how applicable is this to the universe in general? 
Well, it turns out it matters even on the most bulky scales when you're talking about planets. So if you have different ratios of different elements, you make different minerals. In the Earth, the mantle is made up of a mixture of pyroxene and olivine and their high temperature, high pressure variants. In pyroxene, you have one magnesium atom for every silicon atom. In olivine, you have two magnesium atoms to every silicon atom. If we look at the composition of nearby stars, we find a range of magnesium to silicon ratios in them, which means there's a range in magnesium to silicon in the material the planets would have been made out of. And that matters to us because the structure of pyroxene and olivine are very different. Olivine is structurally much weaker than pyroxene. So if you go from a planet like Earth, which has a magnesium to silicon ratio of about 1.5, bump up the magnesium a bit till you're at 1.8 or 1.9 atoms per atom of silicon, turns out the mantle of the planet will become mostly olivine and its variants which is much, much weaker. So the viscosity of the mantle drops by about two orders of magnitude, which essentially means that its resistance to flowing and movement changes. And we can test this in the laboratory. Uh, if you go to our main building, uh, we have a couple of different groups who use experimental apparatus to make magma that's at the conditions of the mid to deep mantle of the earth and that olivine rich material would flow much more easily which means that convection in a planet with extra magnesium would be easier to start easier to keep going that would change the transport of heat within the planet change plate tectonics, volcanism, what the crust looks like, how chemical elements in the atmosphere and things that are related to biology will cycle between the atmosphere, crust, and deep interior. So the whole evolution of the planet over the course of its entire life. And the reason that we get those variations in elemental abundance ratios is the history of chemical enrichment from earlier generations of stars. And since those supernovae are so clumpy and produce things so asymmetrically, and that survives out to encounter newly forming solar systems, planets of stars that are forming even in the same molecular cloud could have significantly different compositions. And the consequences of that for a field like astrobiology are the topic of another talk entirely, and in fact, about half of my career. So I can't top the words of Carl Sagan, the nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple, pies were made in the interiors of collapsing, collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. And if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. And my corollary is then you must blow a lot of it up. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick. That was very nice. Um, there's one question that we have so far, and she says, how do we know that the sun can only use 10% of the hydrogen? That's a good question. Uh, that comes from doing models of the sun's interior, and basically that's the all of the mass of the star that gets hot enough 
for nuclear fusion to happen. Okay, thank you. Um, if anyone else has a question, please type it in the Q&A. Okay, here we go. Um, are the asymmetries just for type 2 supernovae, or are they for type 1A as well? Ah. Uh. Actually, it turns out that core collapse supernovae are much more asymmetric in general than type 1a supernovae. And that's because the explosion mechanism for the two is very different. Uh, it's much easier to produce those kind of large scale asymmetries uh, from a massive star. The type 1a's, you still see the little um, kind of fluffy, flocculent structures, but none of the large-scale stuff, at least not nearly as commonly. Okay. And um, other question, what percent of the supernovae energy is released via neutrinos? Does it vary with the mass? Yes. So the gravitational collapse of the star's core releases about 10 to the 53 ergs of potential energy. And for the mechanism that I described, almost all of that comes out initially as neutrinos, and about 1% of it gets captured into the stellar material. So that big explosion you see is 1% of the total energy available. The rest just goes sleeting out as neutrinos that end up not doing much after the explosion. Things are a little bit different for more massive stars that collapse into black holes instead of neutron stars. You have a different way of coupling that energy with the material of the star. And depending on how you do that, your efficiencies can go up or down a little bit. But most of the time, when you see a supernova explode, all that light, all that mass flying out is a percent to maybe 10% at most of the total energy that the star released by collapsing. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, one of the questions popped up in the chat. This kind of, um, how long does it take to write one of the modeling programs or how, how many careers? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the code that I use to model stellar evolution was started by my advisor in the 1980s and I took it over and it's probably been completely rewritten multiple times over the course of that. Uh, the supernova code I use got started probably around the year 2000 and is an advanced version now. A lot of astrophysics codes stick around for a tremendously long time and just get improved as different generations of scientists use them. And I'm, I'm assuming it's still in Fortran. Um, one of my codes is in Fortran, another one is in C, um, really heavily, really computationally heavy calculations are generally done in C or Fortran because those are by far the fastest computer languages out there. Lighter stuff, Python is the go-to tool these days, but it's anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand times slower. Okay, and a couple more questions have popped up. Can you share a few extra words on those simulations? Are those from your group at ASU? Uh, Monte Carlo, are they Monte Carlo based particle, particle simulations? 
Yeah, so most of the ones we saw in here were from a code called SNSPH, which is used by my group and my collaborators at Los Alamos National Lab. It's what we call a smooth particle hydrodynamics code. So we follow the material in the simulation as a series of particles that have a mathematical description of how the material represented by that particle is actually distributed in space and interacts with adjacent particles. Um, and then uh, there are other codes that we use for doing nucleosynthesis calculations and um, a grid-based code that I use to do stellar evolution simulations. But most of the ones you were you saw were those uh, smooth particle hydrodynamics. And those, um, you and your grad students are uh, running those and modifying the code as you go, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one of my grand, grad students is actually responsible for the result I showed with Cas A and the titanium 44. Okay, and one other question, how close would a supernova need to be to Earth to cause a problem for us? Turns out to be closer than you would think. Um, if you are within about 10 to 30 parsecs, so 30 to 100 light years or so, you will get enough um, energetic cosmic rays that penetrate through the solar wind and get to Earth to have a significant effect on effect on the atmosphere, like possibly destroying much of the ozone layer, um, increasing radiation levels at the ground that can cause a minor extinction event, um, uptick in mutation rates and change in weather die off of some uh, plants. But it's relative, even at that tens of light years distance, it's relatively subtle. Um, the picture you have in your mind of a supernova blast wave ripping the atmosphere off of Earth and pulverizing it is actually not going to happen unless the star is right there next to the solar system. Is that assuming that one of those little fingers misses us? Or is so that those fingers to... are, yeah, those fingers are relatively dense compared to other material in the supernova, but they are still a as good as the hardest laboratory vacuum that we can make. Ah, okay. All right, um, let's see, then the next question is, you talked about this, but can you please elaborate more on the physical path by which the supernova material gets to form us? Does the dispersed supernova material recollapse to form another star and its planets, or does it travel far enough to space to get into another star forming region? In other words, shouldn't there be a supernova remnant nearby us to explain the, the existence of heavy elements? Okay, excellent question with, of course, a complicated answer. So there are a few different ways that that stuff gets into a forming planetary system. So when a supernova explodes or a low mass star loses mass to winds or anything like that, most of that material is going to end up just in the interstellar medium the gas between stars and that stuff is going to get mixed together over millions and billions of years as the gas orbits around the galaxy and interacts so if you look at something like orion where there's star formation going on right now that material has a percent or two of heavy elements in it um, and so all the stars 
that form out of there will have that composition has kind of a baseline and can form planets and stuff. On top of that, you have to worry about nearby supernova events. So more like what I was talking about uh, in this talk. And in that case, usually when you find stars forming, a whole bunch of stars are forming relatively close together. You'll have hundreds of stars forming in an area tens of light years across. So massive stars go through their lives so quickly that low mass stars are still in the process of forming when they use up their fuel, die, and explode as supernovae. And it's those nearby supernovae that can eject a blob of stuff into a newly forming solar system when it's in the little tiny molecular cloud core or protoplanetary disk phase. And that material can be added to what's already in that gas as sort of a background. And so that's where you get something that has, you know, basically the composition of the sun, but a whole bunch of extra magnesium or extra aluminum 26 or what have you. So also a thing to keep in mind is that after a group of stars form, the motion of the galaxy tends to separate them. So 4.6 billion years later, we could never identify any of our siblings. They are probably scattered evenly around the galactic disk at roughly our radius from the center. So the neutron star or black hole from a supernova that exploded near us when we were forming could be 20,000 light years away from us now. And the supernova remnant would have dispersed after only a few tens of thousands of years. So we wouldn't be able to see whatever event happened near us anymore. Uh, I, I think last Wednesday, Paul Scohan mentioned that there is a evidence that a, um, a supernova went off during our formation years of our solar system, what, about 0.3 parsecs away, if I understood them correctly? So there are a few different lines of evidence that say that there were nearby massive stars and supernovae uh, when we were forming. One is the presence of these short-lived radionuclides. The other one is actually the size and structure of our solar system. So our solar system is really pretty compact. Uh, the Kuiper belt is out at about 100 astronomical units and it was probably closer in before the giant planets did some wandering around and ejected it out. Um, but if you look at star formation in Taurus, where you don't have any nearby massive stars, protoplanetary disks are hundreds of AU in size, much, much bigger than ours. When you look in Orion, where you have massive stars, the protoplanetary disks are more like 50 AU across, so much like our solar system. Um, so yeah, there's a couple different lines of evidence that suggest we formed in something that looked like Orion with nearby supernovae. Okay, perhaps one last question, uh, this sort of open-ended, um, what role do magnetic fields play? Uh, the last refuge of scoundrels. <laughs> um, <That's Henry. laughs> yeah, so magnetic fields are difficult to deal with. So for a lot of the history of astronomy, they've been kind of ignored as much as possible. And then when you don't ignore them, you use them to explain things that you don't understand. Things have gotten a lot better 
it's now computationally possible to simulate magnetic fields better. Um, so it's kind of hard to give a precise answer without knowing the context you're interested in. Um, in terms of the supernova explosion, it can be very important for more massive stars, ones that collapse straight to a black hole, bypassing that neutron star stage, can't blow up in the same way. So what we think happens there is material starts to fall in. The star is probably rapidly rotating, so it falls in through a disk. And there's a very strong magnetic field in that disk, which ejects some of that material along the spin axis. And that's where the energy to blow up the star comes from. And that also is where you get gamma ray bursts if you want to get into that extreme end of things. Okay. okay it like sounds that. like that's our uh, questions, right? Yeah. No, take it away, Gordon. I'm sorry, what, Tom? Go ahead, take it away. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, you get a lot of kudos in the in the chat. <laughs> so Thank very nice. you. Yeah, let me echo that, Patrick. Thanks a lot. And there are lots of chats about how well that presentation is. And and Wayne, uh, a few thrown in there on you too. So, uh, great, great meeting this evening. And this is what we're going to continue to do until we can get back to some sort of, uh, uh, back the way that uh, we had some in-person events going on. The next one is going to be July 17th, Friday, July 17th at 7.30. It'll be the same thing, same Zoom meeting. You'll have to request through the vice president to get the link. And that's how we keep security down and make sure that that um, it's just astronomy people that are in, uh, entering it and you know how things go these days. <laughs> so, so Gordon, just to clarify, everybody that was invited to this one will be invited to the next month. It's just the new new people um, need, need to request an invitation. Oh yeah, all right, okay. thanks for clarifying that. Now the next meeting is on July 17th and the main pres presenter is Dr. Jesse Christensen. Uh, listen to this topic, guys. On the road to a billion planets. <laughs> All right, so we'll see what's that, what that's about. Uh, a few things, the library is open, but uh, you have to sign a waiver, it's limited access. Um, they do have some restrictions. Just today, the town of Gilbert put out that um, masks are required in their public buildings. Also in public places, that if you can't maintain the six foot social distancing, then um, you're required to wear a mask. How that's gonna be enforced, I don't know, but that just came out today. Again, let me say member presentations. If you wanna do a quick 10 minute one, let me know. Hit that uh, contact president link on our website and we can chat about it and when we can get you in. And again, our EVAC Facebook page, check it out. Uh, lots of activity on there. Plus some people doing astrophotography from the very beginning up to of course our professional folks. Uh, lots of good stuff there. And I wanna thank everybody too who gets into the Facebook book page to you know keep it astronomy related and any kind of political stuff you know there's room for that all over the place but we're trying to keep this just for astronomy and give uh, our our meeting folks a, a break from all of the political and bad stuff that's going on so I thank you for that that's it that's all I have uh, Tom anything um, that, that's all I have. Call it a wrap. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Wayne, Tom, and Patrick, 
Thank you a lot. A great presentation. And we'll see you guys next month. Bye. Thank you for having me. Take care.